And as far as the keys, uh, the binding and loosings also mention Matthew 18:18, 18, 18, where we read that the other apostles are given the power to bind and to loose, but they're not given the keys. Okay, that clearly indicates that the power to bind and to loose, which all the apostles are given in Matthew 18:18, 18, 18, must be exercised under the keys which were alone given to St. Peter in Matthew 16. And in that very passage, Matthew 18, 17 to 18, we read that you must hear the church. Okay, and if you don't hear the church, you are to be considered as the heathen and the publican. So obviously there's an authority over the church that's involved with this binding and loosing, which Peter was given in a unique way with the keys. And so it, it definitely is indicating the power over the church. Did you want to respond? Yeah, I, I, I tend to think all those things pertain to uh, all believers in a declaratory sense, because we have uh, the, the key of knowledge. We have basically, we can tell anybody in the world, this is what God requires, this is what it will take for your sins to be forgiven or not. Um, in John 20, he says, John 20, 22, and 3, says, And when he said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And immediately after that he says, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Now, a lot of people like to think that that pertains only to the disciples, and but it is clearly tied to receiving the Holy Ghost, which every believer believe, uh, uh, receives. So I don't think that uh, it singles out anybody as having any special uh, power of binding and loosing. I think that applies to all believers. Some people take that to extreme, like the Orthodox, for example. I, I read... I don't know if you've ever read anything by uh, Pope uh, <clears throat> Pope Shenouda the Third, but I unfortunately I have some friends who are in the Orthodox the Egyptian Orthodox Church, and he says that even preaching the gospel is not for the lay person, but only for the priest, which is a pretty outrageous position. But uh, I think all of that applies to um, all believers, especially since there isn't any instruction in Scripture about successions or anything like that. It seems to be very uh, like you mentioned the. Uh, his faith failing not uh, is that uh, I believe I heard you mention once that has that is uh, speaks of his infallibility. Well, that's what infallible means; it cannot fail. And so you see the concept right there. And also in Matthew 16, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Well, heaven cannot bind that which is false. It is impossible for God to lie. Hebrews 6:18. And so what he's binding must be infallible. Otherwise, he'd be binding something in heaven, which is false, which is impossible. So we see the concept of papal infallibility in Matthew 16 and in Luke 22. Furthermore, all Protestants claim to believe in some sort of infallibility because they believe that the writers of the books of the Bible were infallible in those, in those acts. And so they believe that God protected the writers of the different books of the Bible, from teaching error in that specific act. And yet they have this aversion to the concept of God protecting um, St. Peter and his successors in some of their acts. The concept is the same. And so that's an inconsistency that many Protestants uh, demonstrate. But as far as um, apostolic succession, we could, I mean, get into to a lot of those things. But one, one other thing I wanted to mention was, or a few things, it, that in the Acts of the Apostles, we see St. Peter's authority in action over the church. Okay, like he takes the prime role in the replacement of Judas. Okay, after Judas kills himself, he, he stands up in Acts 1, 5, 15 to 20, and Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, concerning Judas, let his bishopric another take. He directs the course of action in replacing him. Okay, he presides at the Council of Jerusalem. Um, it, in some of these other examples, it's so obvious. It just screams out, St. Peter's the leader. For instance, in Acts 5.29, the apostles are questioned by the high priest. And it says, quote, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Well, if all of the apostles answered, then why would it say Peter and the other apostles answered? It's obviously because Peter was the leader. He was the first pope. And, and I mentioned earlier about the vision about the end of the old law, 
okay, meeting out the discipline of the church against Ananias Sapphira. We also read, speaking of St. Paul, that St. Paul, after his miraculous conversion, supernatural conversion, he went to visit St. Peter and spent two weeks there. In Galatians 1.8, we read, Then three years later I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, or Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. And the word there in Greek is hysterio. It means to learn from. And so St. Paul, saying in Galatians 1.8, that he spent two weeks, three years after his conversion, to learn from St. Peter. So, did you want to respond? or? Um, yeah, regarding the... Now, there's no doubt that Peter was a leader. I mean, he was just a natural leader. He was the first to confess Christ, the first one to speak up. Who do you, who do you say I am? He's the first one to speak up and answer that. He was the one who had the idea to... I'm not trying to be a little Peter, certainly. He had the idea to walk on water. Nobody else said, hey, maybe I can walk out there, too. He was the first one to speak at Pentecost, made that amazing sermon, uh, uh, spoke up at a lot of the, uh, the councils. He was also the first to deny Christ, to rebuke him for saying that he was going to die, at, at which point Jesus turned around and said, get behind me, Satan. He took up a sword to prevent his being taken, which was he was supposed to be, and he told them that. He was also there. He was also quick enough to lead astray the Jews, uh, including Barnabas even, uh, for which Paul had to rebuke him in Galatians, where he was. Uh, and I realize that does not uh, run counter to the Catholic Church's teaching on infallibility, because, and this is something that's interesting too. Uh, in order to be infallible, he has to speak ex cathedra. But that's that is simply reading into the Scripture. If you if you can. Uh, infer infallibility from the thy faith fail not, then where in the world do you get the only when you're speaking ex cathedra? That, that, it's just one of those human reason things that cannot be uh, gotten from the scripture, so it has to be basically deduced in there. Because, And there are times you have to do th- certain things like that, like the Trinity, for example. It, it compels you to answer that question about uh, one, you know, uh, the three persons of God dwelling in one Godhead. But there, how does one come to the conclusion that he's infallible only when he speaks ex cathedra? Well, can I answer that? Mm-hmm. Um, well, you come to the conclusion based on Matthew 16, among other things, where he says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Okay, it's not, you know, every statement he makes privately. It's not, you know, his comments about the weather. And so if he's binding something in view of the church, then it is bound in heaven. And so we have an explicit indication that it's that this infallibility is involved with specific acts of a more formal nature. And so that's not like completely uh, foreign to the gospel. That's what we read in Matthew chapter 16. And um, elsewhere, did you want to continue? Or? Uh, yeah, isn't it in Matthew 18 where he also says the same, I think it's 18, I forget, where he says to all of the uh, disciples that uh, they also, whatever they bind will be bound, whatever they lose will be loose. Doesn't he say the same thing to all of them? Matthew eighteen eighteen, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. So he does say that. Oh, as far as the uh, the Jerusalem Council, um, I, I was reading something. Uh, uh, a kind of a friend of mine on uh, YouTube, uh, a set of a contest also, uh, sent me an article, and it was reading about uh, it was written about the council in Acts fifteen, and the conclusion that the writer came to. I'm not saying this is your conclusion, but it, it seems to be. The, uh, conclu- the writer was stating, stating that Peter was presiding over the whole thing, and he basically was, you know, running the show. I, I don't see that in Acts 15 at all in the council. J- uh, he says that James did not, the writer says, James did not have the final say. The final say was said when Peter definitively closed all further debate. James introduced nothing new. That is not the case. Peter said, Peter gave general instructions and general observations. Uh, just kind of general vague stuff about why tempt ye God to put a yoke on the disciples. Our fathers weren't able to bear it. Uh, the Gentiles, but through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, will be saved even as they. Or, um, James closes, however, with a much more detailed instruction and says, okay, this is my sentence. We don't trouble them. We tell them to abstain from idols, fornication, strangled, or from blood. James seems to really uh, nail down the issue and define it to specific instructions for the Gentiles, much more than Peter does. I don't think it's Peter running the show at, uh, at the council in Acts 15 at all. Um, let's see, well, about the 
I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I would say that he clearly presides. When he speaks, everyone remains silent. He's the one who delivers the definitive decision, which sets the course of action and basically uh, directs all the future instructions. And the reason that James closes is because, as Eusebius tells us, he was the um, individual in the early church. He lived from 260 to 340, and he wrote the very first complete church history. And he explains that James was left to be the local bishop of Jerusalem. And so James was given the local authority over there in Jerusalem um, to represent the universal church in that area. And so that's the reason he closes. But Peter's the one that says, we lay no further burden upon you. And that's the definitive decision. And when he speaks, everyone remains silent. He's the first to speak.